Hello, I'm JW, and today we're going to be looking at this device, which is a radio teleswitch. This one was sent in by Alex, and this is a relatively old one, but uh, similar things are still in use, although they're coming to the end of their actual lifespan, as they're no doubt going to be replaced with those ridiculous smart meters which people have now. Now these things are used uh, primarily to switch on overnight heating, typically storage heaters, and they work by a radio transmission, and these things uh, pick up the signal, and they can also be arranged in uh, different codes and different groups, so that uh, though the signal is transmitted all the time, only certain ones may turn on at certain times, and that can be varied depending on the requirements of the electricity company. And so typically they are for night storage heating, usually on schemes like Economy 7, where it's turned on for seven hours overnight, and then the idea is that uh, heats up the storage bricks inside, and those remain hot for the rest of the day. And the night electricity is uh, usually sold at a much cheaper rate to encourage people to use it. Now here's the thing, and it's quite a large piece of equipment, and if you had a matching electricity meter, it's a similar size to one of those. And again, a fairly uh, substantial depth there, and quite a heavy item as well. And uh, this device basically receives the radio signal, and then basically has two functions, one of which is it will uh, send out a signal to your electricity meter, so then it would switch the register to recording on a different rate. So typically you have a night and a day rate, and this would switch between the two. And also it has outputs which actually switch on the electric heating or whatever as well. And if you have a look on the bottom here, you can see the various uh, connections in the bottom there. So obviously you've got the large ones for the uh, high current switching, and then there's others for just low power signal outputs. Now the back is fairly typical of uh, most electricity meters of this sort of age, so you've got the uh, mounting screws would go in these holes here, and another on the top there, it sort of hangs into that uh, slot deal. A little handle there for allegedly uh, carrying the thing. The case is made out of a sort of black phenolic resin type material, or sort of bakelite type stuff. And the window on the front is actually glass. Now we can open this one up because obviously it's been uh, disconnected some time ago. So let's take off this uh, lower cover. So there's a cover there and there's a glass window inside. Uh, notice that the screws are actually retained so they don't just drop out and uh, get lost on the floor. The screws also have a little hole in this piece here so you can put a ceiling wire through. Normally in operation it would go through the holes here and the actual screw head, so it would obviously if someone had actually undone it and tampered with it. Now this particular one says here is made in 1988, and uh, we can actually see on the window here, you can see that there was actually a round stamp there which says 89, so I presume this was uh, put into service then. So here's a view at the bottom, and say radio teleswitch, uh, this particular one came from uh, South Scotland, there is no South Scotland Electricity Ward anymore, that was all gone when the privatisation came in. This Mate made in 1988, and we can see the various screws in the bottom here for the various connections, which would come in from the bottom under here. Now you can see the diagram here in the bottom of the lid with the various connections. So on this side here we've got the actual supply coming in, and this is just the line and neutral from the supply there. And those are actually quite thin wires because all that's doing is providing power to actually activate this device. It doesn't have any particular load on there. The uh, neutral basically would go straight through and not actually be connected to this. And it's basically switching a line here for your main load. So it's basically inputs here and outputs here, again for the 80 and the 25 amp option. And then we've also got some uh, switch neutral outputs here, which again will be used to switch the electricity meter to different registers or various other functions. So in terms of actual power switching, it is just the line that switched, so a single pole, and again the neutral again would just be connected straight through to the other device rather than going through the meter. And again the neutral going in there is just a thin wire, very low current capacity. And see the lid here does actually have a nice set of rubber seal all around the edges there to obviously keep dust and moisture out of there. And the glass window is also against a seal there as well. And again quite a robust piece of equipment. Now that's basically what would be opened for when this was installed, and the installer person would just connect various wires to this and then to the other equipment you've got. Typically this would be uh, the outputs for the either 80 or 25 would go to a separate consumer unit just for your night storage heaters, and again those would just switch on and off as this thing decided. Now I'll take out this other screw in the middle here, and again this would normally be sealed as well, and you can see what's in the top. 
Again, same arrangement there with the captive uh, screw there. So we're going to open this and see what we have. Now on the top here we've got a ferret rod antenna, and this is the thing which would actually receive the radio signal. Now the uh, signal for this is actually transmitted on 198 kilohertz. That's also the same as the Radio 4 long wave signal. Pretty much covers the entire country from a single transmitter. And it's got uh, this sort of plastic arrangement here. And you can actually take this out and then uh, put it back in in the alternative alignment. And the reason for this is that once this is screwed on the wall, this could then be positioned in either position A or position B, depending on which one gave the best radio reception. And this is very similar to what we have in a normal type of radio. And if you turn the radio on sort of long wave or whatever, then uh, actually rotating the radio around physically will affect the signal strength considerably. So it's got the two positions there. And if I have a look on the plastic moulding, now we can see here the uh, position A, which goes across, and then position B, which is where that is currently positioned. So that will be set on installation, depending on which one gave the best reception. And then on the front here, we can see there's a little plug there, which can be moved either to A or B to indicate uh, which one is selected. This one's currently set to A, as it was when we opened it. The plug here doesn't actually do anything else. It's purely just an indicator. So it's just a little plastic peg, which uh, just presses into the hole. No actual other function other than a visual indication of the position. Now we can't really see much else in here other than uh, what we've got. There is a little red LED down the bottom there on that red uh, panel there. And then the rest of the stuff is concealed inside. One other thing of note in here is there is a set of switches. I see the switches down in there, so just eight of those which are basically on or off. And those will be used presumably to set up the various uh, codes and other options, so depending on what uh, code you pick there would determine the exact time it switches on and off depending on what signals are received. Now although these things were normally just turned on and off uh, overnight at a fairly determined period, it's totally possible and was actually done at certain times to switch these things on and off at different times. So for example you could have a uh, whole town or something where some people's stuff came on at one time and then some others came on a bit later and that would be a way of uh, sharing out the load depending on what kind of capacity was available. And it could even be used for things where, say, a power station had some major fault or blew up or something. You would obviously have a lot of uh, reduction in the generating capacity. And then this system could be used to send a signal to some or all of these to turn off a load of heating so that the rest of the grid could actually continue operating as normal. So uh, quite a useful uh, system there. Now, of course, these things aren't designed to be detached more than this, but uh, of course we will uh, just go in further and see what we can find inside. So got a uh, screw here. So we'll just uh, undo that. Uh, we'll just have some more screws down there, and presumably down there as well. Those screws obviously just go directly into the plastic, but of course not designed to be opened after the thing is manufactured. So uh, let's just see what we can... Uh, get out of here. So there's just the back case, just again the same uh, phenolic resin or bakelite type material. It's just moulded uh, in one piece there. And this is the kind of stuff that uh, if it does actually uh, get overheated it doesn't actually set on fire and melt. It basically just chars a bit and gives off a disgusting odour. So uh, quite a safe material to make stuff from. Unlike a lot of those new consumer units which are made of the kind of plastic which just melts and then sets on fire. So here's the assembly, and we'll see that it's uh, basically a circuit board on the back there. And of course this metal uh, shielding can pretty much over the whole of the top there. Which to shield it from any uh, interference there, interfering with the radio signal. It's wet here by the way because it's quite cold as it's uh, been outside for a while. So uh, a bit of condensation there. So let's just see if we can get into this a bit further and see what's underneath the metal can here. So the bottom can just uh, clips in position, so that's handy, you don't have to uh, desolder anything. Uh, we can see the back of the uh, circuit board there. It's rather a strange uh, red covering that it has on there. And then so we've got the side pieces here, which uh, appear to just clip over as well. So the back plastic there is just a clip-on thing, just over the circuit board there, just a slot and some little tabs which go into a hole on the edge of the board there. The antenna just has the two wires going straight down to the circuit board there. And then hopefully this top 
piece will uh, either lift out or remove some other way. So, right, so just actually uh, just slide over the top, and there's some little tabs here which uh, secure it into the circuit board and whatever else. So, fairly easy to get into there. And um, we can see the actual main circuit board here. And um, we see the two relays there for switching the actual output, so presumably one for the 25 and one for the 80 amp version. Little uh, configuration switches here and some others here which are sort of like these uh, jumper type things for some other configuration. Three uh, so sizable capacitors there and then it's various other sort of uh, through hole components there. A single sided board so uh, no components on the back, it's just the connections for the various items. So here's a close look at the board. So this is the say, radio receiver section here. Where this is the antenna wire coming across say, from the ferrite rod there. Basically just a uh, ferrite core with a winding of wire around that. I think it just comes straight over to the circuit board at the bottom here. And these here will be used to uh, tune or align the receiver for that. And it'll be done at the point of manufacture. Now if you go over this side here, so there's the two relays, so presumably one for each of the outputs, so a 80 and a 25 amp switching point. And uh, the rest of this here is just uh, various diodes and resistors, so uh, fairly old type technology, but bearing in mind this was made in 1988, so it's uh, 30 years old at least, and of course the design may actually be older than that. Now over here we just have three capacitors. 1000 microfarad, 35 volts, and uh, three of those just all in a block there. Not a huge amount in the bottom there, just got a single sorry, transistor there, and then this uh, other actually, a transistor or similar device in the middle. And in terms of actual uh, active components, we've got the main uh, chip here, those two small ones there, and then a uh, third one over there. This is a uh, Sangamo branded chip, so no, that's some uh, custom-made item specifically for them. Uh, 8828 is the number on there, we've got 204030. Highly unlikely it's going to mean anything if you uh, go and search that up on Google or whatever. Uh, these two over here are both actually the same, so N2003s, and again they're both uh, identical. And then what's presumably the main uh, processor or chip here, and again, this is another Sangamo branded part, made in Japan. And again, the number obviously on there, so it's fairly likely this is just some custom piece uh, specific for this one application. So there's not a huge amount of circuitry in here, and it's uh, fairly likely it's all been sort of optimised down into just this one device, or possibly the other one as well. Because bearing in mind, these things were made in the many millions, so of course it would have been worthwhile to spend the extra time and money to make it uh, basically as cheap as possible for manufacturing. And that's pretty much uh, what we've got here. Now those two relays are actually here, so it's fairly obvious that those do not switch the uh, 25 and 80 amp uh, currents because the tracks from them are tiny, so clearly those presumably are for the switched neutral outputs. And again, as we saw in the diagram here, you've got the two, uh, two amp switches there for the two neutral outputs, so that presumably is what those relays are for, so they couldn't possibly be switching the full current because those tracks obviously would uh, burn away and uh, vaporise in seconds if any kind of substantial current went through. So those just go down from the, uh, say, relays are here, and just go down straight to the various terminals on the bottom. Here's the terminals on the bottom, and we can see this uh, nice bit of design here where they've slotted the actual circuit board, and then this plastic shield actually comes down between all of the various contacts to provide additional insulation between those. So uh, again, all of those are obviously made to match up with those, and it looks like it just clips in with these two points here, and there's just a peg that comes through presumably for location. So see, we're going to just remove that as well. So this cover is actually glued on by these two pads. They're not actually sticky, but it was sort of stuck onto the top of there, but uh, presumably just to through age or whatever. So we've got a little transformer here which appears to be for providing power to the rest of the circuitry there, as it's just connected to the incoming supply. Bear in mind this is 1988, so the era of the sort of high frequency switching power supplies hadn't really arrived. So it is literally just little uh, mains on one side and uh, some lower voltage on the other to drive the electronics. 
So these two relays would be for the neutral switching, and then the actual power output are these ones here, which of course are substantially larger. As you can see there, and on the front, you can see we've got the large copper bar coming across there to the terminal here, and again we've got the uh, thick wire coming across from this one, and on the front here we have the two uh, connections for each one. It's going straight through into there and straight through there. So uh, fairly uh, high size things. Obviously, if it's going to be switching at 80 or 25 amps, then that's pretty much what you would expect. And again, all the uh, terminals just go straight through there. So these do not actually attach to the circuit board. They're better it's just going straight through into the bottom of the device there. And we see the little red uh, indicators here, which can also go through to the front panel. So then you can obviously see the state of the relays for each one, the 2580, on the front there. Now, as I saw before, the shield here in plastic goes through the circuit board. And this whole assembly is actually uh, just a slot-on piece. We've got this uh, connector here, which is between the 25 amp one, which just plugs over the tab down there. The 80 amp is a solid bar, which just comes across to that. And this whole assembly is actually one piece. So there's the two relays and the high current terminals associated with those. As so they just go through to the bottom there. And then that just leaves the board underneath. So all we've got on here, presumably the low current ones from those two small relays here. And of course the inputs for the actual power supply, which goes via the transformer here. And in terms of the relay is actually being powered, then uh, there's a good bit of design here. I've got uh, on the board here, I've got these three pins, which are sticking up there, and of course another three over there. So they're basically soldered into the board. And then the relay assembly just goes over the top of that. And then in the bottom of the assembly here, we can see just in here that there's three contacts there for each one. So that's what we'll be doing the actual switching to actually turn the outputs on and off. Here's a close look at those contacts. So you see it's just one, two, three, and they're basically double sided. So the pins would push in there and obviously make contact with those, and then the other relay, of course, is exactly the same. So that's what's inside a radio teleswitch, and say so this one about 30 years old or so, probably a fairly old design as well, could even be older than that, but certainly very well designed and clearly optimised down to make it as cheap as possible, but still being able to actually have a certain amount of quality involved, certainly much more than the uh, cheap matic uh, modern meters, which uh, don't seem to be particularly well made at all. And so many uh, different outputs here for various uh, switching options. And of course the two uh, very large relays there for the 80 and 25 amp main switched outputs for your heating. So look inside the uh, Sangamo radio teleswitch. And although it's quite a large and bulky piece of equipment, it is very well designed. I just saw there all those uh, metal shields and the circuit board and the plastic bits and pieces all fit together perfectly and literally just clip in place with uh, no problem whatsoever. So a substantial amount of time and effort went into the design of that, making sure all those things were perfectly sized and all made to fit properly and perfectly every time. And bearing in mind that was made in the 1980s, so although computer design was available, it was certainly nowhere near the standards of stuff today. So again, a substantial amount of effort went into the design and manufacturing of that. Now, teleswitches say is still in use in the UK, and it's likely they're going to be eventually phased out because of the newfangled smart meter revolution. And unfortunately, smart meters are a bit of a bust at the moment because there's already been two versions of the things put out. There's the first lot, which uh, was a bit of a fail, and now there's the second lot, and a third version is already in the planning. So uh, a bit of a mess there. Smart meters do not work in the same way. They use the mobile phone network for communication, whereas this thing just uses a receive-only type of transmitter. But uh, in any case, uh, say still in use now, and uh, whether smart meters eventually have that functionality in is uh, another matter and something to look at at another time. So until next time, thanks for watching.